We're going to move into a time for the message now. If you're going to take your Bibles, if you have them, take and turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. We're going to be picking up in verse 26 and going through verse 39 uh, momentarily. The title of the message this morning is Jesus Casts Out a Legion of Demons. As we continue our series called uh, The Miracles Jesus Did, and we are trying to get beyond the miracles to the message as we've been talking about how every miracle Jesus does has a message to it. And it's not just something he does as a healer. It's not something he does just to wow the crowds or to prove that he's the son of God, though it certainly does that. Uh, they have messages that are timeless, and we'll be getting into that. But before we go back 2,000 years uh, to Jesus' time, uh, we're going to stay in the modern times a little bit more. Bob and I were having a conversation in the office yesterday, and we were talking about the early Apple computers, the early Macs. Uh, Apple was one of the early and big hitters in the computer industry. And we were talking about the Macs that we first uh, learned on. And, and the one that Bob learned on was even uh, more retro than the one that I learned on. I remember working on an old Mac at school when I was uh, in high school, and it looked kind of like this. And Bob said, man, that's pretty updated compared to what I had. I had this big drive on the side, you know. Uh, but this was the screen, and we both remembered that it was a green screen, with mostly white print. There really wasn't much by way of graphics. There were some two-dimensional pictures, and I mean, this was it. I mean, we didn't know how it could get better than this when this came out. And I remember doing a journalism class in high school and typing out my, you know, the newspaper reports and things on that. Uh, it was awesome. Uh, now, Steve Jobs, uh, who found, was one of the founders of Apple, left in 1985 after a struggle with the board of directors who felt that he needed to let go of the reins and let some other people uh, rise to leadership. But in 1996, they called him back as the company was floundering and the stocks were plummeting and they needed somebody to get them out of the mess that they had gotten themselves in. And when he returned, there were 350 different projects in development at the time. And Steve Jobs says, our goal isn't to make the most stuff. Our goal is to make the best stuff. And he reduced those 350 projects down to 50 and began focusing. But he found over a short period of time that even 50 was too many and that they needed to narrow it down even more. And so he narrowed it down to 10 projects in development. And the focus was the next big thing, not the next lot of things. What was gonna be the next big thing? So of course, Apple has produced things like the iMac, the iPod and iTunes, and of course, uh, iPhones, and all of which has been game changers for the industry. Also, Steve Jobs worked on uh, changing and bringing back sort of Apple's alluring and hip image in order to be something that people felt like they could identify with and wanted to be a part of. It was the best turnaround of all time. I mean, the stock rose more than 9,000%. Too bad for those guys who gave up early and sold their stock, huh? Well, the story of humanity, the story of creation is another turnaround story. It begins with the spirit of God hovering over the waters in the beginning. And then seven times I counted in the book of Genesis chapter one, seven times God declares creation to be good. He invested so much of himself in it that at one point it says, and he created man in his own image. Male and female, he created them. I mean, that's investing yourself into something, to create it in your own image. But by chapter three, the stocks begin plummeting and there's a major fall. But don't sell your stocks just yet because the CEO is going to return in Jesus. And he's going to re-enter the story with none other than the spirit who was present at the beginning of creation, hovering over the waters. But now the spirit hovers over Jesus at his baptism and it begins to work in him and through him. But in order to reconstruct, he must first deconstruct. Jesus must cast out a legion of demons. Right before Jesus lands on the shore, in our passage that we're going to be reading momentarily. Uh, he's going to, and before he meets the demon-possessed man on the shore, 
there's another important scene. We're not going to read it today, but know that it comes right before our passage and that the two go together. And the scene is Jesus on the Sea of Galilee when a sudden storm stirs up the sea. And the waters begin flooding the boat, a lot like the ancient waters of the earth flooded the earth. And the boat is being swamped and there is danger and there is chaos on every side. But the same spirit who hovered over the waters of chaos in the beginning and is now with Jesus on the waters of Galilee. And that spirit has returned in this new man who represents a new humanity called the second Adam, that's Jesus Christ. And Jesus speaks a word and the waters retreat. And God's creative ordering spirit is at work in him. But this destructive chaos isn't limited to the, only the waters of creation, but it's present in the lives of human beings as well. And that's what we're going to encounter when Jesus reaches the shore as we read this account in Luke chapter 8, verse 26 to 39. It says, They sailed to the region of the Gerasenes, which is across the lake from Galilee. When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had commanded the evil spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him, and though he was chained hand and foot and kept under guard, he had broken his chains and had been driven by the demon into solitary places. Jesus asked him, What is your name? Legion, he replied, because many demons had gone into him. And they begged him repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. A large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. The demons begged Jesus to let them go into them and gave them permission. When the demons came out of the man, they went into the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When those tending the pigs saw what had happened, they ran off and reported this in the town and the countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. Then all the people of the region of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, because they were overcome with fear. So he got into the boat and left. The man from whom the demons had gone out begged to go with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and told all over town how much Jesus had done for him. The word of the Lord. Now we know from the chronology of the story, if we went back a few passages, a few chapters, that Jesus and the disciples had departed from Capernaum, which is on the northwest side of the lake, the Sea of Galilee. That was Jesus' ministry base, his center, and where he lived with Peter and Peter's mother-in-law lived there. Now he's heading to a region across the lake known as the Decapolis. This is Gentile territory. And the forces that he encounters are forces that have twisted nature and they have set themselves against him as he's headed over to that region. And it's no surprise then that when he arrives on shore, a demon-possessed man meets him because these forces had already been against him before he ever got out of the boat. And so we begin with a force of nature. The storm really sets the stage for the message. There's an unseen destructive force at work. And this isn't just about angels and demons, but it's something that's amiss and intertwining itself in the fabric of creation itself. Jesus talks about this in a parable that he shares about a farmer who sowed good seeds in a field. The farmer had sowed good seed, but when the wheat came up, they had found that there was all kinds of weeds entangled and growing up within it. Now, Jesus tells us in that parable that it's not for us to pull the weeds because we'll end up ripping out the good wheat with it. 
Of course, humanity is always trying to pull the weeds and we're constantly doing damage to what's good in the process. But this unseen destructive force isn't just at work in the things around us. Though we're better at seeing problems in the things around us rather than within us, these things are at work in our lives as well. When Jesus arrives at the sh on shore, the obvious problem isn't just out there somewhere. And so we come to the nature of man. In verse 26, it tells us that Jesus and his disciples were headed to the region of the Gerasenes across the lake. And now here's where we run into some textual and geographical challenges. Matthew, Luke, and Mark all record this event. And as you look back at the earliest manuscripts that we have written in the Greek, there are differences in all of them, like in the same gospels. So you pick up different manuscripts from Luke and sometimes you get a different name for where Jesus ended up. They all start with a G, but they're all different. There's Jurassa, and then there's Gadara, and then there's Gergesa. There are three different places in the region of Israel. And so you have uh, down at the very far right is Gerasa. It's modern day Jerash in Jordan. And that's where our text today, uh, that's what the NIV says, this is the place. Although you'll see a footnote saying that some manuscripts say this or that. So the problem is, with uh, Jurassic is that it is way down to the southeast, many miles away from the shore. So we can pretty much rule out that Jesus didn't land there, right? That's not just across the sea. And then what we do have in common of all three of them, uh, they're, they're all part of what is called the Decapolis, the Roman cities of this region. The next candidate is up here, and this is Gadara. And Gadara is that, it's actually right over here in this region, but it extends all the way to the bottom of the Sea of Galilee. So on the southeastern corner, it meets up. The problem with this as a location is that we know that Jesus and the disciples are in the midst of a storm leaving from Capernaum and the distance between Capernaum and Gadar is 13 miles. It's unlikely that they went 13 miles in the midst of a storm. And the text also tells us that where they were going was just across the lake from Galilee. This is the region of Galilee on the north, uh, west and west side of of the Sea of Galilee, and then this is a region that is ruled uh, by another called Galantitis, and that is another one of Herod's sons. So one of Herod's sons is over here, and another rules this region. So the most likely candidate is uh, Gergesa, which is just across the lake from Capernaum. Now, in verse 27, it says, when Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. Now, put on your first century Jewish ears for a minute and listen to how the text describes the man. He's not wearing clothes and hasn't been for some time. Now, when's the last time in the Bible where we saw chaos over the waters and then shortly after that in Genesis, people showing up without clothes? That's Adam and Eve. And when they realize that they're naked after sinning, and their eyes are opened and they realize and they are ashamed, what does God do? He makes clothes for them to cover them, which is an image of him covering their shame. And this man has no covering. Now, the second thing we notice is that he's living in tombs. Now, for the Jewish people, the tombs are a place of uncleanliness. Dead bodies, if they come into contact with tombs or, or dead bodies, they become ceremonially unclean and they are not able to go to temple and worship and they have to go through a process of cleansing. And this man is living in the tombs, which means he's living in a state of uncleanness, a perpetual uncleanliness. So what we have here is a man that humanly speaking and certainly Jewish speaking would say is without hope of redemption. But it's not just about those people. It's not just about the Decapolis and the Gentiles, but it's about Israel as well. In the Old Testament, there is a verse that describes this scene to a T, uncannily, but it's not talking about Gentiles. It's talking about apostate or wayward Israel. In Isaiah 65, verses three to four, it says, they have become a people who sit among the graves and spend their nights keeping secret vigil 
who eat the flesh of pigs. So where are we? We're at a tomb in an area where they keep pigs. This man doesn't just represent the Gentiles, but he represents all of humanity. And we remember that Jesus' miracles are messages. So Jesus arrives on the shore and the scene is set. There's tombs, there's pigs, there's evil spirits. Jesus, another way of saying this is Jesus enters our world and finds everything corrupt and tangled. Or even more personally, Jesus enters our lives and finds everything disordered and disrupted. And this is a powerful force that's at work, disrupting things. It's powerful enough that the man, though he's bound in chains, hands and, hand and foot, breaks out of those chains. So this is an unnatural power. And this power, this spirit, leads toward isolation and loneliness. It said he, it led him towards solitary places. For modern times, we might say it leads toward a rampant individualism. We are not in full possession of ourselves. We are possessed by many forces and powers and voices, all vying for our attention and vying for our allegiances. Verse 30, Jesus asked him, what is your name? Legion, he replied, because many demons had gone into him. I had a friend that was upset about someone's political post on Facebook. Uh, and rightfully so, there was a lot of blame, there was a lot of uh, finger pointing, and there was quite a bit of belittling in their posts. And my friend said, I know this person. What are they doing that's any different than the rest of us? What gives them the right to condemn and to belittle everyone else when I know how they live and it's no different than anyone else? What made them a spokesperson? But then my friend said something else that I thought was very insightful and asked the question, and what's triggering me about that that makes me so angry? What's triggering me? What, why does this make me so angry? Why can't I just let it go and not care? What's going on? What's going on below the surface here that I'm responding like this? Has this ever happened to you where something triggers you and it's something that someone else can overlook very easily and you wonder, why does this bother me so much? And you're upset and you don't fully even understand the reason why you're so upset. It happens to me a lot. And only once in a while am I really paying attention. So why am I so bothered by this? What's going on beneath the surface? Or maybe you wrestle with a certain obsession or addiction or sin, and you don't even understand why it attracts you so much. There are these voices that are in us and yet foreign to us. And we realize that the problem isn't just outside of ourselves. It's not just out there with everyone else. But these are things that we wrestle with, voices that we struggle with in our own lives. Perhaps that's why God chose an apple or a fruit as the object of the first sin, right? It wasn't just a possession that remained outside of you. It was something that you consumed. And as you consumed it, you discovered that it consumed you. It's something that you took into yourself and it becomes a part of you, who you are, your makeup. And before we go blaming outside forces like demons, for our own ailments and ill tempers, which is something I was prone to do for many years. Everything was a problem either with someone else or with unseen forces. James tells us in chapter one, verse 13 to 14, James is a brother of Jesus. And he says, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. I always wished it would say there, or the devil, right? But the devil does tempt. He goes on to say though, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. And then here's a key that really started changing my views. It says, but each one is tempted by, when, by his own evil desire, he is dragged away and enticed. So we can't blame God and we really can't even blame the devil. Because the devil, when he's working on us, he's only working with what's already there. When we're tempted, the devil's just playing to our desires. So we're really in a pretty messed up position. And we're all in the same position, so it doesn't help us to look down on our neighbors. There's some chaotic force that's at work in the world 
and in human lives. But then Jesus arrives on our shores. And he begins showing signs of what's to come. Nothing less than the restoration of all things. What we have here is a seemingly unredeemable situation. A man who's living in a state of separation from God and really from the world around him. He's possessed by many voices and it's a power that's too strong for him to overcome. He's not in his right mind. But he has this encounter with Jesus and Jesus is, un, is able to untangle his chaos. This is what Jesus came to do, to untangle us, to untangle the chaos that is so entwined in our lives. We call it redemption and restoration and salvation. This is the good news of the gospel. No one is too far gone to be redeemed. That's the message behind this miracle. A man is living in tombs. He's living in a perpetual state of uncleanliness. He's possessed by powers too great for him. And yet Jesus is able to redeem his life. No one is beyond the point of being redeemed. God specializes in worst case scenarios. We see it all through the Bible. I think of Mary Magdalene. The scripture says that she was possessed by seven demons and she becomes one of Jesus' closest friends. And the early church called her an apostle to the apostles because Jesus sends her to tell the disciples that he is risen. And then there's Paul and he's possessed by something even worse than Mary Magdalene. He's possessed by something worse than seven demons. He's possessed by legalistic religion. You know how hard it is to break free from that? Think of all the religious leaders of Jesus' day. They were the ones that had the hardest time accepting that he was from God. Both of them are worst case scenarios and yet both of them become Jesus' closest and most influential disciples. No one is beyond redemption. In verse 30, it says, the demons beg not to be cast into the abyss, which is sort of a Jewish and really Gentile holding place for spirits. But they'd rather live within unclean pigs. But notice that the chaos drives the pigs towards self-destruction. We saw it in what they did to humans, but pigs have even less of a will, so they just immediately run down and cast themselves into the sea and destroy themselves. And if you're following the imagery and you still got your Jewish eyes and ears on, then what happens to the demons? Well, they're swallowed up by the abyss. This Greek word that translates an Old Testament Hebrew word, the word in the Old Testament is, for abyss, is watery depths. Watery depths. And so there's all this symbolism in these pigs drowning and going into the abyss, which means that these demons are being separated. They can no longer cause chaos in the world and in God's creation and in human lives anymore. They are indeed sinking into the abyss. And then... We see this man, and he has a new position. Verse, verse 35, it says, When they came to see Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind. Jesus has untangled this man, and there's only one voice that he hears now, and it's God's voice in Jesus Christ. And if you still have your Jewish ears on, where is the man sitting? at Jesus' feet, which is a position of discipleship. Disciples sit at the feet of their rabbis to learn and to listen. This man has become a disciple of Jesus. And the townspeople, well, they're afraid because all this untangling isn't good for business in a tangled up world now, is it? So they ask Jesus to leave their region. And the man begs Jesus to be able to follow him but Jesus restores him to his family and to his home. He tells him to go and to be a light and a witness where he is. And the man returns home to his family where he can be a husband and a father, a great father's day for him to be able to return back to his kids, 
and his wife. And he can create a family of disciples because that's what fathers are supposed to be doing, creating disciples, first and foremost, in their first ministry, which is their family. And then he will carry the transformative power of the Spirit into his community because the power that was at work in Jesus is now at work in his life. And he goes into his community with that power and it begins to transform them. And we get further on into the message. When Jesus comes back, guess who's greeting him on the shore? Not just one man demon-possessed, but a whole crew of people come and meet Jesus on the shore. Why? I'm guessing it's because this man shared the testimony of what Jesus had done for him. And that power was unleashed in that region. And they're ready to receive Jesus when he comes back to that community. Happy Father's Day. What a great message. Might we live into it. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks and praise. We're thankful that you are our dad. We're thankful to have a God like you and how good you are to us. And we're thankful that our lives are not beyond redemption. And Lord, we, we witness, we testify, we admit that we hear many different voices. And we're thankful to have your spirit to help us sort it out, that we might tune in to the one voice that we need to hear, your voice alone, that we might know you, the one true God in Jesus Christ, whom you sent to untangle our tangled up chaotic lives, that we might sit at his feet and be disciples of him, and that we might go out into all the places you send us with a testimony and a power at work within us and through us. Your spirit, which was hovering over the waters in the beginning and now hovers over our lives, transforming not only us, but we pray all that we come in contact with. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, who is able to do more than we could ever ask, think, or imagine. To him be the glory in the church and in our lives and ultimately in the world. May we be a part of this redemption as you redeem all things. And we pray, Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. May we be found faithful when he comes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.